Okay, it's going to be an ROH classic review of Death Before Dishonor, the original Death Before Dishonor from 2003. Uh, so we're going all the way back to July 19th, 2003, Elizabeth, New Jersey at the time. Uh, the biggest show in ROH history, 1,200 fans, as Christopher Daniels alluded to uh, during the show. So Daniels was actually in Japan getting live updates from Alice in Danger as the show was going on. So you, you see a whole bunch of Daniels promos scattered throughout this whole show. Um, but, you know, because, you know, it, because it was the biggest show, Daniel still was 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 one of the founding fathers. So it, it was important to have him involved uh, in some fashion. But, yeah, when I look back at the history of Death Before Dishonor, it really is kind of like their SummerSlam or their summertime show. I mean, it's never been consistently, uh, you know, during the same month. You know, uh, I remember Death Before Dishonor 3 with, with Punk's promo. That was actually in June. Uh, this month they had it in July for the original Death Before Dishonor. I, I remember Death Before Dishonor 5 weekend was in August. And uh, I'm looking uh, now. It, it looks like they're actually going to have one in September. So, you know, it's pretty much a summertime pay per view. It's it's not as consistent as like a Super Card of Honor where they 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 would always have it WrestleMania weekend or or anything like that. But yeah, I, I would definitely say you could you could definitely argue that Death Before Dishonor has been, you know, probably the most consistent you know ROH series. Um, I definitely think you could argue that. So I was actually looking at Wikipedia. They don't actually have this, you know, the first one on Wikipedia in terms of like a match listing of results and attendance or anything like that. But, you know, they, they have a page with all the main events. And I'm looking at the main event history of Death Before Dishonor. And, uh, you know, it's funny. Like, I've, I've, I haven't seen like a whole bunch of them like after, the, after 2010. Like, and the, the one that really sticks out is... Uh, Kevin Steen versus Rhino, like that main event. So I, I, th I think, you know, the history of the show definitely kind of took a turn, like at, at a certain point. But uh, for the most part, I, I would definitely say like until 2010, you could argue Death Before Dishonor as being like, yeah, the probably the most consistent series I, I think Ring of Honor's done. But uh, but yeah, let's not waste any more time. Let, let's let's talk about this actual show right here. Um yeah, I, I, I would probably say you could argue this as being the best show of uh, 2003. I think most people would agree this is probably the best show of 2003. I think the only show that could probably rival it is uh, Main Event Spectacles. But uh, but yeah, it's it, it's tough to even say looking back at this. I, I think this definitely could have been a better uh, show. I, I think the double main event is a little bit underwhelming looking back in retrospect. But when you look at this show, it, it definitely has a very ECW type of feel to it. You know, they're still associated with Robbie Feinstein and RF Video. You know, those are the guys that distributed ECW. So there's it, it still ECW written all over it. Plus, it still has like that that underground, you know, club night scene with Special K and you know all the um all that all that rave stuff going on at the beginning of the show and then you had Jeff Hardy so from a personal standpoint i i do remember that Jeff Hardy uh the Jeff Hardy appearance got a lot of attention got a lot of controversy and uh it it did make news on the wrestling head headlines i did i did remember reading about how Jeff Hardy got booed uh the shit out of a ROH show so uh yeah the Jeff Hardy stuff is is very memorable um but yeah, I, I I would definitely say when when you look back at the show, I, I think it's probably going to be remembered for the CM Punk and Raven match. Uh, it's it it might not even be the best Punk Raven match, but I'll, I'll tell you like it's it's definitely the most memorable uh, thing associated with CM Punk and Raven. You know they they show all the build up, all the promos, the aftermath, the post, the pre match promo, uh, the Punk and Raven stuff is really the 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 show stealing uh, thing of the night and. I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's it's more about the feud than the actual match, which makes it so memorable. But uh, but yeah, man. Uh, but for, from top to bottom, this this is still a very very uh, well laid out card. So the the first match of the night, you actually got low key, actually kind of breaking up this this rave with all the uh, special K people out there. So low key just starts, you know, squashing the crap out of. Uh, you know, a couple guys at first, and then all of a sudden he takes on Deranged. And uh, him and Deranged actually have a, a pretty good match right here. Loki actually sells for Deranged. You know, he, and it, it almost seems like Loki's the type of guy where, like, he needs to have a certain amount of respect for you to actually go out of his way and, and start selling for you. So it, it definitely had that type of feel. 
But overall, uh, Loki just looked awesome here. This was his return. Uh, I remember the first Ring of Honor show I went to, I think it was Rising Above 2007. Like, there, there were fans like behind me that were like, oh man, I'm going to mark out so hard if, if Loki comes out. So in a lot of ways, I think Loki was a really big draw, at least for the indies. He just had a great look, a great voice. Um, he was just someone that you always wanted to see. You know, he just, he had a lot of these, uh, you know, really, really fun and good comebacks and returns. I remember when he turned heel. It was pretty awesome as well, but uh, and the, this is the show where it has my favorite low key promo with uh, Gary Michael Capetta. So, so Loki actually goes to him. He, he's like, "It is none of your concern. What you should be concerned is asking the right questions, listening to when I talk." I just love the way he said, "This is none of your concern." I always, I always felt like, like if someone's like nagging at you and being too nosy, I, I always, I always say to myself, just, just start talking like Loki and be like, "That is none of your concern." So yeah, Loki, Loki um, had a pretty good comeback here. It's just a shame that he wasn't more involved in the Ring of Honor title picture, like after he lost the belt. Like he was never really consistently part of the company when you, when you, when you, uh, you know, get out of. Uh, uh, 2002. So, and then next up, you got Matt Stryker actually taking on Jimmy Rave. Uh, what really stood out about this match here was um, how underrated Jimmy Rave was. I mean, he was, they really treated him like he was this new phenom that could really wrestle and really go. And Stryker did go over here, but um, it was, it was more about just kind of showcasing Jimmy Rave. So it was really interesting because I think over the years, Jimmy became more of like a prick, you know, a guy that a guy that the fans didn't respect, and you know, for whatever reason, he became like underrated. But this was kind of like the showcase of uh, you know Jimmy Rave's talents. This this had to be one of his first matches in Ring of Honor's right there. So, and I know him and AJ Styles did a lot of good stuff, you know, later on in the year as well. But uh, yeah, good showcase from Jimmy Rave. Let's move on to the next match. You got Hot Stuff Hernandez, Fast Eddie, Don Juan, and Rudy Gonzalez of the Texas Wrestling Academy. I think all those guys were part of the whole Shawn Michaels uh, uh, wrestling school, if if I'm not mistaken. And they take on the Carnage crew with uh, Just Incredible. I, I thought this was cool right here. It, it for for the summer of 2003, this definitely worked. You had so many bloodthirsty fans out there that loved high spots, table bumps, and you know these guys just really laid it all on the line. I thought this was actually fun uh, for a while it lasted. All right, so next up, you probably had the weakest match of the night. You had the purest. Who is actually Tony Mamaluke and uh, John Walters uh, taking on the Outcast Killers? It, it, it was it was kind of a bland matchup right here. So Mamaluke actually goes over by submission, I believe, and they actually start playing the Godfather uh, theme music. I, I I guess they were going for Walt. You know, Walters kind of has more of a Sicilian Italian look. And so maybe that's what they were going for with the pairing right there. But I just didn't think this whole thing worked. Yeah, definitely the weakest match of the night. And by the time it ended, I almost like I, I had to like wake up and be like, man, I didn't even really pay attention to that. So it, the match really didn't get my attention. And uh, yeah, pretty much had a, a lame ass finish right there. De definitely. Pro if there's one thing that could have been scrapped from the show. There you go right there. So uh, next up, you actually had Tom Carter actually taking on Doug Williams. This is like a showcase of just two really, really good uh, technical wrestlers right here. Um, yeah, I, I don't really remember much about Tom Carter, but yeah, he was he was pretty good. You know, the, the, the crowd reaction to him was kind of lukewarm. They, they were definitely more into Williams. Uh, Williams did some really good selling here when he delivered the chaos theory and was sell, selling the shoulder. Very believable stuff. And Carter looked exceptional, like from a technical standpoint. But... I, th I think the match was just missing a little bit uh, personality. Uh, uh, it was missing a lot of buildup. They, they could have done a better job of presenting Tom Carter than more than just a, you know, a generic technical wrestler. E even Gabe said on commentary, and this might have been the wrong call, where he was like, well, this is just like two great football teams just colliding. But, you know, sometimes you got to give the fans more than, you know, these are just two great wrestlers that, that know how to wrestle. But, uh, yeah, I thought Tom Carter actually looked really good here. Um, but you know, he's, he's not someone that they consistently brought in after this, but, uh, but I, I get the appeal. You, you want to have Doug Williams on a, a show like this. So, and then we move on to the match of the night. Yeah. I got to say, this is a match of the night. This is a number one contenders trophy match. You got homicide taken on BJ Whitmer, Cocobana, Dan Moff, amazing stuff. They, they all these guys, and, and this, this is what was great about ring of honor. Um, 
you know, even back then, it, it just seemed like everybody was just allowed to just do their thing. Like no matter, no matter how crazy they were going to get, everybody got the green light here. I mean, this is this is as good as I've ever seen B.J. Whitmer look. This is as brutal and as reckless. And, you know, homicide, I'm just going to say right here, this is homicide at its best, reckless abandon. This is MVP homicide right here. The, this 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 match right here is, they put it on his 2003 MVP mixtape, and uh, he was the MVP of this match without it. Even Cabana looked awesome here. He looked athletic. He looked lean. There was just some nasty, nasty stuff here. And the, Dan Moff's facial expression when Homicide was... Um, was kicking BJ Whitmer was like he was like oh man I am not fucking with that guy so it it, it had some really nasty stuff in it and he, even Moff looked incredible here I I just thought all these guys delivered it was fast paced it was it was violent it was brutal uh, the ending BJ Whitmer doing the exploder to Colcabana um, Gabe actually does his dangerous uh, signature commentary to end this thing so yeah I. I'm, I'm going to say that, that this definitely had to be the match of the night. You know, it, it wasn't the, the most memorable thing of the night is the Punk and Raven stuff. But I, I just think from start to finish, for an actual match, this this was the best thing all night. This actually made the top 100 uh, Ring of Honor matches from the top 100 shows and uh, well-deserved as well. So good stuff there. Next up, we got Special K. Special K versus the SAT and the, Back, the Backseat Boys. So this is a four-on-four -four, uh, tag team match. Mikey Whipwreck was actually part of Special K. I believe Jay Lethal was up in there as well. This is a lot of fun. I I, I thought all these teams uh, look great here. Uh, so th the match actually ends. Um, I believe Trent Acid actually gets pissed off at one of the SAT guys for botching something, and that's how they lose the match. But yeah, in, in terms of athleticism, in terms of just you know. Um, you know, just a lot of good tag team stuff going on here. I just, I thought this actually worked. You know, all the, I thought all these guys look good. For whatever reason, Mikey Whipwreck was still extremely over with the fans because he's an, you know, old school ECW guy. I thought Trent Acid looked, you know, pretty much at the top of his game. Uh, the SAT was, was, those guys are really good as well, man. So you had a lot of talent in this match. It, it didn't feel like your typical filler uh, Special K match. It was definitely a step in the right direction for Jay Lethal as well. Yeah, so just a really fun uh, eight-man tag match right there. All right, next up, we probably got uh, one of the worst matches of the night. Uh, we got Jeff Hardy taking on Joey Matthews, uh, taking on Crazy K. So um, I think this might have been part of the agreement that Jeff was only willing to work if, if they brought in this, uh, I, I guess, maybe one of his students, uh, maybe one of the guys from the Hardy Wrestling School. I don't know, whatever his name is, uh, Crazy K. So he had to be on... Yeah, he had to come along with it. And it almost felt like Jeff Hardy was just really there just to kind of help him out. And obviously, you remember Joey Matthews from Eminem and everything. So, yeah, Jeff was wearing a mask. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, the show did really well, though. Like, and that's, that's the funny thing. Like, they, they, they had, Gabe said that they drew an extra 100 girls because uh, Jeff Hardy was in the crowd. And you could definitely hear the girls were screaming for him. But, you know, the... The Ring of Honor diehard fans were, were booing him. Uh, the reason was that Jeff actually did a, uh, a shoot interview with RF Video, and he talked about how he lost his passion for the uh, wrestling business. So, yeah, I, I think Jeff actually did get fired after WrestleMania. I, I think he did. I know his last pay-per-view match in 2003 was against Jericho and No Way Out, which I thought was a really good match. And, you know, For a long time, I thought that was the match of the night from No Way Out. Uh, 2003 but bottom line was Jeff Hardy was gone uh, from the WWE at this time you almost forget that it actually happened but uh, yeah I mean just I, I, I wouldn't say that Hardy treated the match like he didn't care obviously he cared about getting his friend over but yeah I mean this was just I don't know like it just it, it, there was just no creativity here it, it almost felt like very generic just kind of going through the motions but the bottom line was, um, from a crowd reaction standpoint, it, it was it was interesting. It, it, it was definitely interesting. You know, Jeff Hardy had, for whatever reason, he always had a huge connection with teenage girls. And the Hardys have always had a great connection with the teenage fan base. So, um, so yeah. But, but, yeah, Ring of Honor and women have never really gone together. Like, you know, they, they never really did a great job with the women's wrestling division. And I was looking at my demographics on YouTube and it's funny, 0.02% female audience. 
And I'm sure a lot of that <laughs> has to do with, uh, you know, classic Ring of Honor reviews because they just don't really appeal to women for whatever the reason. But uh, but yeah, that's that's another topic for another day. But I just thought that might be an interesting note. All right. So next up, we got CM Punk versus Raven, uh, the dog collar match right here. So you guys know, I mean, we, I've, I've talked about this match so many times. Um, never reviewed Death Before Dishonor 1, though, a, a, as a whole. But um, but yeah, obviously the Raven feud did a lot for Punk. Um, you know, Punk cut some of the best promos of his career on Raven because of the fact that it he reminded him of his father. Uh, obviously, he blames Raven for a, a lot of the drug issues in wrestling about how so many people have, you know, gone down uh, negative paths and how Raven has destroyed lives. So yeah, this this was just a very emotional uh, a feud. So this ended up being the the dog collar match. And I'll tell you, my one gripe with the match is there's too much stuff in the crowd. There's too much stuff in the bleachers. It, the, the lighting was way too dark for a lot of the stuff. But uh, but if you look could look past that, this is a really cool match. I thought Punk cut great promos. Uh, he cut the first promo on the actual show backstage. He had a promo with Robbie Feinstein where he was selling the, uh, you know, the... He was showing his frustrations at Tommy Dreamer and, and Raven, you know, pouring beer down his throat. So I thought that was great. And and then there's actually a pre-match promo, which was Punk, Punk talked about how he was better than everybody else because he's drug free, alcohol free. I thought that was another great promo. So, yeah, if you're a CM Punk fan, you'll, you'll definitely love this show. Um, but other than that, man, I, I I thought the match was 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 really cool, very dangerous as well. There, there's just so there there was a spot where Raven was on the bleachers doing the Raven pose, and then Punk just kind of yanks him with the dog collar, and it looks like he's about to break his neck. But hey, I, I guess if you know it's coming, it's a little bit easier to prepare for it. So I, I thought I thought you know some of some of these some of these spots were you know it was cringeworthy with the neck. But uh, but aside from that, I, th I thought Raven looked good here, man. Uh, a lot of stiff clotheslines from him. You know, he had he had some really, really good offense here. Uh, but the bottom line was Cole Cabana actually comes out, interferes, and gives CM Punk the assist. So Punk actually does win the match. But, you know, it, it, it almost, it almost uh, it's almost bittersweet for Punk because, you know, Tommy Dreamer comes out. Uh, Danny Doring comes out, who's, I guess he was like one of Raven's protege, which Punk totally shit on him. He's like, Dar Danny Doring, where the hell did you ever go at the, you know, b at the tutelage of Raven? And, um, yeah, and then they, they, they tie Punk up to the, they duct tape him to the ring. And uh, him and Tommy Dreamer are like, you know, they're, they're pouring, you know, beer down his throat. And Punk is acting like he's about to die. It, it's something to see. It's, it's pretty controversial. Uh, it looked like it really did bother Punk, but uh, yeah, to see Tommy Dreamer and uh, and Raven together again, it was it was a great moment, you know, because you know that that had been a really personal feud in ECW, as as a lot of you guys might remember. So yeah, the this whole, you know, it's more it's more about the match, you know, the the all the promos leading up to the match, the aftermath with everything with the alcohol, and. Um, but I did want to, before I move on, I did want to make this point. Like, I never really appreciated, like, how Raven was so, you know, like, despised by Punk because, uh, like, for, for whatever reason, Punk kind of singled him out as, like, the the poster boy for, you know, what not to do in, in wrestling, for, you know, to become a wrestling tragedy. And, and it's funny because you know who else singled out Raven? When Benoit won the world championship, I think it was like before Backlash, he he did a uh, a show with Michael Landsberg. Uh, it uh, you know it was a Canadian show, so um, so he actually asked him about you know all these wrestling tragedies and you know uh, you know why, why why there's so many deaths in wrestling and and and, and Benoit actually singled out Raven. He said that it's it's not it's not the it's not the industry that does it to you. It's you that do do it to you. And and then he said, you know, Raven. I heard a report that Raven takes three hundred pills a day. I was like, three hundred pills a day? Are, are you fucking kidding me? And then he also singled out Lex Luger as as someone that's in it for the the pension and not for the passion. So it was interesting that 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 even someone like Benoit uh, actually did single out Raven for all all his uh, you know pitfalls. 
But uh, but yeah, man, the the, the CM Punk Raven feud w w was cool. But you know what? This might not have been their best match. I, I I remember they had a steel cage match at the conclusion. You know that might actually be the better match. Uh, but I'd have to check it out to watch it again. Um, all right. So next up, we got AJ Styles and the Amazing Red taking on the the Briscoes. This is the third match. So they, they actually had a match at uh, Night of Champions, which is the same show where Joe won the ROH World title. I think they had a rematch at the Epic Encounter. And then they had this match right here. I'll tell you what, this, this was probably the weaker of the three. And uh, it's kind of surprising. I mean, you would think Death Before Dishonored 3, but, you know, it, it, it's about Amazing Red. I, I think Amazing Red uh, definitely was working through an injury here, or maybe he suffered in the match. He just... I don't know. You didn't see a lot out of him uh, after after this show. I mean, when, when you look back at TNA in early 2002 or even Ring of Honor, you know, the classic match with Loki in 2002, you know, Amazing Red was a huge player. But, you know, after this after this 2002, 2003 school year, um, you know, he really wasn't he wasn't that visible again. And I, I even think AJ had to find the replacement. Uh, to tag with uh, later on at the end of uh, 2003. So, yeah, you know, th this was cool. You know, what, what really stood out here was the Briscoes. The Briscoes actually came down to the ring with Nas's song called The Cross. From It was from the Godson album, which actually produced by Eminem, but I totally forgot about that. I thought the Briscoes always came down to the uh, the uh, the Leonard Skinner theme, but 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 not, not in this... Uh, not in the summer of 2003. So that's just an interesting side note. But yeah, for the Briscoe's age at 18 and 19 years old, I still thought they looked uh, incredible back then. It, it's amazing how long and how good the Briscoe's have always been. So yeah, they, they hit some really good signature moves. The Doomsday Device, the J-Driller. There were some great breakups. I thought AJ, AJ was definitely on top of his game. He was definitely an MVP candidate. Um, so Red actually is selling uh, the bad knee. So he sucks it up, hits one of the bristles with the Shining Wizard. AJ does hit the Styles Clash. But when the match ended, I was like, that's it? I was like, I was just expecting more out of this. But, you know, I, I, I'm just going to assume that Red was really working through a lot of pain. And, you know, the match had to be cut short. From what I remember, I, I remember the Night of Champions match being phenomenal. I think that definitely made the top 100 ROH matches list when, when the fans actually did vote on it for the first 100 shows. So we move on from there. Next up, we got Samoa Joe actually taking on Paul London, ROH world title match. So this is like the first like emotional farewell in WWE history. So Paul London actually signed with the WWE. I, I think I was actually at Paul London's first house show uh, or one of his first house shows. Uh, they, they actually came to Madison Square Garden I think it was on uh, September 20th, 2003. And I remember London was actually at that show. Uh, me and my brother were there. And, and we said, man, we never seen anything like that. He did like a standing shooting star press. So, yeah, that, that was a pretty good house show. I, I remember Angle's sister just passed away. So they had to change the main event. And it ended up being Brock versus Undertaker in a steel cage. And that was during the whole Lance Storm boring era. So the fans were just cheering boring at the top of their lungs. So, yeah, but that that's just a side note. So, but yeah, London, bottom line was London was able to get the WWE contract almost before anybody. You know, he was just such an amazing athlete. And um, yeah, but you know, the, the, the match with Joe right here, it's, it, it's a, it's a little bit underwhelming. Um, and it, it, it kind of, it kind of did set the tone for, you know, maybe the summer of punk and, and maybe it did open the do door up for, you know, let's be creative if you know somebody's leaving. So you saw, you know, you saw that with CM Punk in the summer of punk. You even saw that in PWG with, with Brian Danison when you, you thought Danison would put over hero, but Danison actually ended up winning the belt and vacating it. You know, that, that, you know, that decision caused a lot of controversy, but yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it was just one of those situations where everybody knew Paul London was leaving and uh, it, 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 it's kind of like they made the mutual decision just to make Joe look strong. You know, Joe was really overpowering here. He basically no-sold Paul London's shooting star press. You know, London looked good. You know, he tried to make this competitive. He actually bridged out of a lot of uh, great German suplexes and dragon suplexes from Joe. So o overall, I still think the match is good. It definitely does hold up, but, you know, the match didn't get any attention in terms of, you know, one of the best matches in ROH history or anything like that. It's more so well known for the Paul London aftermath. And, um, 
you know, so I, I but in, in terms of Joe, I, I thought Joe looked great here. He looked, he looked slim. This is when he had the blonde hair. And uh, yeah, I, I thought Joe was really at the top of his game. So, uh, but you know, in, in, even in the summer of 2003, the, a lot of Joe's matches were booked more about him looking dominant than him putting on like a classic. You know, I think when you get to the summer of 2004, it was more about, you know, putting on classic matches, you know, cause they were in survival mode, you know, at that time. So I, th I, I think, you know, a lot of the, the decision-making in terms of Joe definitely changed, especially after the scandal, but yeah, London here, you know, we, he was treated great. And, uh, what you re really remember about this is London actually kissing the, uh, ring of honor ring, kissing the, uh, the ROH logo, um, you know, Jordan actually did do that, you know, after he retired, uh, you know, with the Bulls. Uh, so very reminiscent of that. But yeah, just the um, what really surprised me was the cohesiveness of the ROH locker room. And it's funny because Ring of Honor didn't really run that many shows back then. But all these guys must have been like a family. Like maybe maybe it wasn't, you know, just Ring of Honor. Maybe it was indies that, you know, we probably never even heard of. But all these guys, you know, felt like they were losing a brother. And um you know, it was just fun to see all the, you know, Homicide, Low Key, Joe, and, you know, uh, Lond uh, London and Joe actually posing with the ROH world title. I, th I thought that was great. So, yeah, yeah, the, the match definitely could have been better. Um, I, I definitely think London and Joe could have had a much better match in them. I wonder if they actually had a match on the indies um, that was better than this because, you know, I, I, just, I just felt like, you know, when, when London actually... Joe had him in the Chiquita clutch, you know, London's hand dropped three times from the referee and the fans were really disappointed. They were like, oh man, they, 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 they really wanted to get behind London, but it just wasn't the case. Yeah. So uh, yeah, th this double main event is a little bit under, uh, underwhelming, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was a, it's a historic ROH show for London. Uh, definitely an emotional farewell. It's it's the first emotional farewell. I mean, you've seen it time and time again. These emotional farewells that have happened in Ring of Honor, and and this was really the first one. But yeah, man, th this is a well-rounded show. You got the return of Low Key. You know, you you, you got that that homicide fatal four way, which is just, you know, it's earth shattering how how uh, crazy that was in in terms of the the freedom that those guys got. Yeah, you had the Jeff Hardy stuff which got more attention than anything from the show. I, I would definitely say the CM Punk and Raven stuff was probably the most memorable thing. And then you got you, you got a rematch with AJ Styles' Amazing Red against the Briscoes, which is probably the worst out of the trilogy. But it was still good stuff, though. And then you got Samoa Joe defending the belt against Paul London and, you know, the very first, you know, emotional farewell in ROH history. So without a doubt, I would still say Death Before Dishonor from top to bottom. You know, 2003, it, it still wasn't the time where, you know, it was it was very much so like catering towards the ECW fans. It really wasn't about like putting on amazing Manhattan Mayhem level shows. So I, I, I'm going to say Death Before Dishonor. I remember like, I think it was the only show from 2003. I think I rated like a 9.0 or whatever. I don't even know if I still go that high, but I remember Death Before Dishonor, Main Event Spectacles. You know, those would be probably the, the, the two best, you know, both Rexplex shows, the two best shows from 2003. So that's pretty much it, guys. That's the original Death Before Dishonor, and I'm out. All right.